everyone and welcome back from our short break. On this episode, we're going to be talking about Fred Verster. Um, he is the team principal for Ferrari. Now, on the episode, we have Hannah, Ido, and myself, Chelsea, and I'm going to start us off with just really a little history on who Fred was before Formula One. Now, he was born May 26, 1968 in France. He graduated from ESTACA in Paris, and he specialized in aeronautical engineering in 1995. His interest in motorsport, it started actually pretty young from an early age, and during his school years, he ended up creating RPM, and that was like in 1982. And this was a company that actually ended up preparing Formula 3 engines for Renault, which we will see a little connection later. Now, in 1996, Frederick set up and ran the ASM team, which competed in Formula 3 racing series, which was a partnership alongside Renault, coincidentally, like Chelsea mentioned earlier about RPM. He ran this team all the way up until 2015. In 1996, Sebastian Philippe um, got third in the championship, and then in 1998, David um, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, won the French Formula 3 championship. Later on in the 1998 year, um, Diedler, which was a partner um, alongside Frederick, decided to sell his shares of the team to Frederick Foley, which was also the year ASM race cars were set to race and venture out into the rally side of racing, with the first race being the rally raid. During this time, the ASM primary team focus was on the talent development, which while doing this, they focused success on winning the Xenofort Masters in 1999. The ASM team also won the Erst Wild Korean and prestigious Matkuru Grand Prix in the Formula 3 series. But on another note, in the year 2000, Frederick entered their rally division in their first Dakar, getting seventh overall. And from 2003 onwards, Vasseur and ASM really dominated, honestly, because at that time they entered the Formula 3 Euro Series, where they, especially him, guided some of the biggest names throughout the years. For example, 2004, they won the Euro series with Jamie Green and that was the team's first major title and a clear indicator of Vasseur's managerial and technical expertise. I mean, they entered it a year before. Usually teams need a few years to get going. And then 2005, Visser recruited a name that we all know and love, Lewis Hamilton, as a rising star from karting and from La Renault. And under his leadership, Hamilton dominated the 2005 Formula 3 Euro Series season, winning 15 out of 20 races and obviously, therefore, securing the championship. The success was pivotal in launching Hamilton into Formula One, honestly, because he didn't stop dominating until there is a 2021 or 2022. And then of course, 2006. The following year, Paul de Rasta, who we now know as an F1 pundit, took over from Hamilton and won the championship as well, further solidifying the team's reputation. Like I mentioned earlier, Frederick's primary focus was on driver development. Now listening to Ido talk about Lewis Hamilton, it appears he's doing just that, and it is absolutely amazing. Truly, because his ability to develop drivers during that period was remarkable. His team nurtured several future Formula One drivers, including Lewis, as mentioned, Paul de Resta, Nico Rosberg, and they all obviously they all drove for ASM. And in Nico in two thousand four, even finished runner up to Jimmy Green, who also drove for ASM. 
that year and won the championship. So they got one too. But they didn't only nurture these talents, they also proved to have the best technical package and created this competitive environment that prepared these drivers for the very rigor that is top level of motorsport, which made them such great, in my opinion. And then, of course, in 2004, he also established Art Grand Prix. He co-founded it alongside Nicholas Todd, who, if you're an old school F1 fan, well, old school, like 90s, early 2000s F1 fan, will know the name Todd because we had in early 2000s and the 90s, we had Sean Todd, his dad being the team principal at Ferrari and also later involved with the FIA. The team itself competed in the newly established GP2 series, now for Mar2, which acted as a very, very direct feeder into Formula 1. And Art quickly became one of the major competitive teams in that series, thanks again to Fred's expertise. And honestly, as I mentioned, he, he just has this knack of developing young drivers across all series that he took part in. And I mean, he developed drivers like Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, and later also Charles Leclerc, but more on that in a second. Now, between 2007 and 2011, Fred took part in what was basically the Lotus and ART Grand Prix project. And during his time there, he was recorded saying, this is a fantastic opportunity for ART Grand Prix to be working with Lotus. The goal is clear. It's winning together in the future GP2 and GP3 championships. Now, this merger ended up creating two cars for the GP2 Europe and GP2 Asia series and three cars in the GP2 Europe series. Our GP did stay unbeaten in Formula 3 until like 2009 as well. We also had in 2008 Fred respond to Felipe Massa's legal action for the 2008 F1 World Championship and this was when Lewis won. Now even though Fred was not a part of the F1 world, we know that he had a special spot in his heart for Lewis after their championships together in F2. But this was a really sensitive issue in F1, and we've talked about it in other episodes, and Fred said he thought it would actually be really strange for the championship title to change. He ended up saying that in general, he said it was weird to him for a race winner to change at any time, even 15 minutes after. And I kind of agree, because like the FIA really needs to, at least in my opinion, fin figure these things out like during the race. We've seen it many times where drivers will get like, these insane amount of like I don't know hits like either either it's point hits or they get they have to start from the other race the next race or whatever it is and I hate that it's always after and you know I'm excited to see this relationship with Lewis rebuild now in like 2005 and moving forward that Fred are going to have because I think they will kick the FIA's ass together um we also know that during Fred's time with the RGP he was able to not really like help but he was kind of involved with like Jewel signing onto Ferrari for the long-term contract in 2010 because at the time um, Jules was managed by Toe and he was the co-owner of RGP with Fred and at the time Jules had just won like the F3 Euro series with our uh, F3 so this was like a huge deal back then for motorsport fans and I think we're going to kind of see that very often with Fred just continuing on in Formula One that he's going to be the one that connects with drivers on the grid like wholeheartedly. Now with his vast experience in motor in the motorsports industry so far, Vasser founded and started Spark Racing Technologies also known as SRT. In 2012, which also was based in France, it was primarily developed in focusing on hybrid and electric powertrains and single-seater systems. 
At the end of 2013 going into 2014, Frederick obtained a contract from the FIA to construct the 40 chassis for the inaugural Formula E series, which was an incredible win for SRT and they were one of five that won the bid. Now, during this time, since they started with Formula E, Spark slash Frederick was the unique provider that also provided parts for their racing cars while also doubling to also provide racing assistance in engineering services to some of the teams as needed, which was incredible to see and kind of just proves and sets in stone just how much Frederick has able and had done in just his year so far before even getting the Formula One. Now his introduction into Formula One. In 2016, Frederick first appeared in the Formula One paddock as Reynolds' new team principal, which was his first step into the world of F1, allowing him to see the inner workings of what the F1 paddock looked like. Now, Frederick was brought on board to the recreated Reynolds team, becoming their racing director, the team endured a more difficult season than they would have hoped with multiple retirements and crashes, only scoring eight points during the entire season, and it represented the team's worst performance to date at the current time. But while it was difficult, his time at Reynolds was short-ended, as Frederick left shortly after the end of the season due to disagreements with the managing director on how the team should be run in the future of the team. Now, while he left Reynolds after only one year, he did garnish quite a bit of attention, which was just the move from the junior categories to what we've considered the major leagues at this point. Yes, I mean, that media attention was, on one hand, due to the fact that he very recently joined F1 and had such a storied history, but it also allowed him to join Sauber in 2017. Um, and that team, as we know, um, was later known as Alfa Romeo. Um, and honestly, he joined Sauber at a time where it was very much in a steady but still rebuilding phase. And thanks to him, they rebuilt, dare I say, beautifully, because he increased their competitive edge of the Swiss-based team. And because of all of his experience in professionalism, when he joined Sauber in July of 2017, um, following that tumultuous period, he really was able to get them back on track. I mean, they struggled financially before and everything. So he was really there to steer a ship. And when he took over, he was truly, dare I say, able to do that because they had just survived an ownership change after being purchased by Longbow Financial and there were some serious concerns about its future in F1. And thankfully, his first move was to stabilize the team by canceling a planned deal with Honda for engine supply in favor of continuing with Ferrari engine, a move that also helped secure a more competitive power unit and better tactical collaboration with Ferrari. Personally, I like to think that these small connections end up kind of creating this butterfly effect of where we see Fred joining Ferrari now and his success in doing it. I also think it helped that he understood the creation of the cars and the engineering side and he kind of used that to help him make the strategic decisions at Sauber and kind of what we're seeing now at Ferrari. Oh, definitely. And that wasn't the only thing he did because thanks to him, pretty much, Sauber was able to bring in Alfa Romeo as a title sponsor beginning in 2018. 
The rebranding of the team as Alfa Romeo Sauber brought not only financial backing, but also a strong technical partnership with Ferrari because in case you didn't know, Alfa Romeo and Ferrari have this very long history going back all the way to the 1930s. And that deal resulted in such close ties also with the Ferrari Driver Academy, which saw talented drivers like Charles Leclerc make their F1 debut with Sauber, for example, in Charles's case, 2018. And it also reestablished that whole idea of young drivers entering via F1 via Sauber. I know we haven't talked about the present just yet, but I feel like it's a bit of a full circle hearing Charles's name mentioned and that they work together at Sauber and later on will be mentioned when we talk about Ferrari. Yeah, Fred, the king of full circle moments. But anyway, under his leadership, um, Sauber saw a significant rise in performance and therefore competitiveness. For example, 2018, team finished eighth in the constructors with Charles and Marcus Ericsson as drivers. Leclerc in particular impressed with several points finishes, helping Sauber become more competitive in the midfield. And if you know how F1 prize money works, the midfield can mean the difference between millions, like between one or two positions, there could be a difference between five and 15 million very easily. And that often means one to two points. In 2019, the team fully rebranded as Alfa Romeo Racing and Ferrari Junior Antonio Giovinazzi joined alongside 2007 world champion Kimi Raikkonen. While the team struggled to maintain consistent point finishes, Raikkonen's experience helped them achieve some solid results, um, seeing a fourth place finish, for example, at the Brazilian GP. And Fred's talent to mix experience with youth is amazing in this regard. Because he always had team building and still to this day and long term strategy in mind as he focused on building a team with long term capabilities by expanding the technical staff, improving facilities, and strengthening engineering and aero departments. And while self Sauber Alfa Romeo didn't have the resources of the top teams, Visser was praised for creating a stable foundation and maximizing the available resources. I really enjoy hearing about the type of team principal he is. He seems to really focus on creating that space of improvement and enjoyment rather than focusing on the stress and push of the race. I think that's why the drivers tend to succeed under him and why we're seeing past drivers work with him again. Most definitely. And honestly, his relationship with other teams while he was at Sauber, such as Ferrari, remained pivotal. The team regularly benefited from Ferrari's power units and at times became a training ground for the Ferrari Driver Academy, like Leclerc and Giovinazzi. And of course, also being able to pull Raikkonen, who had his start in Sauber, back into the fold after leaving Ferrari. But that didn't mean they didn't struggle, because while he helped the team improve and avoid the back of the grid, Alfa Romeo still faced challenges in climbing higher in the competitive midfield, especially after 2019. They consistently battled with the likes of Haas and Williams, but a lack of resources compared to bigger outfits kept them from breaking into the top five in the constructor standings. 
but that didn't mean that when he left Alfa Romeo after 2022, he didn't leave them in a better place than when he arrived. He had stabilized the team financially, attracted sponsorships, improved competitiveness, and helped forge stronger ties with Ferrari. I mean, just an anecdote from that I remember from DTS season one, when they first interviewed him, he actually said that before he started at Sauber, they hadn't run their wind tunnel in two plus years because they just didn't have the technical available availability as well as the financial resources to run it. I mean, that's huge for an F1 team to have to admit that. But as I said, he helped improve that with financial backing, etc. And I feel like this progress is still somewhat felt to this day at Sauber. Now, by the end of 2022, Fred was seen visiting Maranello, where he spoke to Ferrari and made a deal to join the team as their team principal. If you were a fan at the time, I mean, I personally had a lot of feelings when this happened. Um, at the time, the team was under Binotto, and while we all know his relationship with the drivers and teams could be really rocky, I think it was especially Charles who had a rough time, and he was still bu building his career in Formula 1 at that time. So I was very happy for there to be a change that high up because you knew it was really going to affect how the team worked moving forward. And under Fred, I feel like we've really seen a shift in the team because there's like more light moods for the drivers and the pit crew. I feel like they're definitely more focused on team inclusivity and really making sure decis decisions are made with both drivers in mind. I know sometimes in a race we might think that they're favoring Charles or Carlos, but I feel like most of the time they really are just focusing on winning as a team. And while Carlos is leaving the team, we know Lewis Hamilton has now been signed on for the 2025 season and moving forward. So we're going to see more changes coming. And while this move was absolutely chaotic, I mean, <laughs> whether you followed Formula One or not, you were listening about this. It was kind of like this event that took over the world because... This was a legacy, you know, this is Hamilton. He built this, Mer like, history with Mercedes. It will go down in history as one of the best racing partnerships in Formula One. And to kind of see this shift in the grid of power changes, I feel like we just have to acknowledge what has been done under Fred already and what he knows the drivers are capable of doing. Right now, Charles, with the past two seasons under Fred, he's gotten over 450 points and Carlos has gotten over 290. Just knowing that, I truly see Ferrari succeeding. And moving forward, I feel like Fred is going to continue focus on the team succeeding, not just to win and get money, but to kind of show his drivers and teams that like this is the success from your hard work. And I know that right now I think it's like a McLaren and Red Bull fight but I think next season we're gonna have a much higher chance of seeing maybe more of a Ferrari and Red Bull fight or McLaren and Ferrari fight for the top two so the changes that Ferrari and Fred are doing are very interesting but I feel like we're going to see a lot of success coming forward although I will miss my Carlito so <laughs> rip that relationship <laughs> I will say when that news came out about Lewis moving to Ferrari, I think like Chelsea said, we all were dead. We were like, what the heck just happened? What is going on? And then just seeing how good Ferrari has done like as a stepping stone for this year, I am so excited. Even though, like Chelsea said, we're missing Carlos. But at least he'll be in a Williams. But I did want to just mention a few things about Fred. Um, and that it was important to know as we listened here on this episode and as we talked about it that fred has been involved in every single angle of the racing side of sport from the business side to the engineering aspect to the creation of the cars which is certainly impressive to note throughout his career just how 
you just don't see that very often. Not many team principals have seen and done every bit and aspect of it, whether or not it was Formula One or whether or not it was Formula Three. And then like we talked about earlier, Spark Industries, Fred is actually still a managing partner of that. And they are actually now the sole provider of for the Extreme E series. Um, so if he ever decided to leave Formula One League or ever choose to do more on the electric side of racing, it's still there. And he's probably still banking on it. Oh, he's definitely still banking on it. And that's what I love about him because he has his fingers everywhere, it feels like. He can take his knowledge that he gained from the different aspects and inform other sides of racing. For example, I'm sure um, because of his involvement with Spark, he might um, either take over some personnel or basically other, basically there's always an even exchange of information. It, it, I hope so. And I feel like that could actually give him the edge because as Chelsea said, right now, the constructors very much feels like a Red Bull McLaren race. But what about next year? What about Lewis? I mean, it that signing February 1st, 2024, will go down in the history books of Formula One, if not the world, because I feel like it was the signing heard around the world. But at the same time, while I was shocked while it was happening, knowing Fred's ties to GB2 to Lewis from that time period, it all made sense. I feel like it was truly Fred's master plan. And I will say, on the topic of like his example of relationships with drivers some people kind of thought that Charles maybe didn't have a say in like the decision of bringing Lewis into the team but I'm pretty sure it was either this like morning or something Fred did like an interview where he shared that like Charles was actually a pusher in getting Lewis onto the team and like encouraging the decision and Fred thinks it's really important for the drivers to not only have good relationships but like healthy relationships and he sees that within them and um i think that's really important to kind of know because we know that like the carlos decision it happened like it's already done but a lot of people were saying how charles and lewis as two almost top drivers in the team together could be really complicated I think under Fred, it can actually be very simple, which is just that you do your best. And every every race, I'm sure they're just going to go for whichever driver has the higher chance. Maybe it's Lewis, maybe it's Charles. I feel like they're both drivers that can easily compete for the championship, especially in similar cars. But we've also seen that in the past that it doesn't work. And I, just, I think Fred creates a very healthy team. So I'm really excited to see if that's continued to prove in true going into the 2025 season with those two personalities now together i also think one thing i love about fred is just how he brings in a level of like fun aspect into his team and into the drivers and how he like approaches situations um i mean this past year we saw his love and his jokes around with mclaren which was fun to see um and it just shows like how genuine and how like lovable he kind of is um so i think having charles and lewis on a team together next year we might see like more of a fun side to lewis that we don't typically get to see at Mercedes. So I'll be interested to see how that turns out and honestly also loving what kind of social media content can come out of that. Yeah, I feel like the whole social media and also like Grilled Bread and everything else that comes with it will be very interesting to watch come 2025 because as um, Chelsea and Hannah said, Fred is a very fun person. I mean, for example, Toto's wedding. He was invited and he started eating 
the floral arrangements on the table randomly. Um, I mean, if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Fred, I don't know what does. But Or, for example, when he jays, chased Joe around um, the paddock with a water gun while they were both at Alfa Romeo. Um, and that whole, him as a loving, fun person mixed with um, his previous history with Lewis um, will be a very interesting mix. I feel like a team dynamic wise, but also social media content wise, because in the past, Lewis hasn't, he's done some socials with Mercedes and like stuff like Real de Fred, but he wasn't that active. So it will be interesting to see that shift, whether it is a shift. I also think something very interesting about Fred when he moved to Ferrari and how he kind of took over was he didn't, his main focus wasn't really on the car. Like they wanted to fix the car, but his main focus was more like you can't really wipe out a team. Like he's like, you have to just kind of fix people or fix certain people and the rest will kind of fix itself which I think is very true if you know if you work at a job if your manager sucks everyone else sucks if you have a good manager everyone's in a good mood so I'm I feel like that's kind of the snowball effect he did because I remember one time I it, this was a while back when we did like a Ferrari episode or something but I was reading an interview that someone did with Benotto or um like about a Ferrari race or something and apparently the whole time he was like straightening his pencils like OCD, very straining, blah, blah. And the interviewer was like, I wonder if that's how he ran the team and that's why they struggled so much because he was in consistent control. Whereas Fred has been, you know, spoken about in past interviews by other drivers and more so described as someone that is willing to try a million things and a million solutions than to think one solution is the best solution. And maybe that's actually the biggest difference between him and the past team principal and why things are changing because for example a lot of the pit stops was one of the main issues during the last team principal and I wonder if it's because Fred is so open to trying new things and being open to different solutions that maybe aren't even from him that they're succeeding more in specifically Charles's pit stops because I feel like that was a pretty big issue with them so I feel like Benotto just has like this mindset and <laughs> I can understand why it's probably hard once to have as a team principal because it's a lot of money on the line, but he is more focused on kind of like, what was it? Like on identifying the weaknesses and like hitting them head on instead of creating band-aid solutions. Like he would rather wipe something out and start from scratch than try to fix something. And I kind of respect it because some things just can't be fixed. You know, you said something, Charles, that actually kind of resonated with me pretty well is something that I was always taught in my career is you're only as strong as your weakest link. And in Fred's case, it was like he saw the gaps, he saw the issues, but also let people grow and empower and get better, um, which is pretty incredible to see. But then as we saw, like, I'm so sorry to reference this and so sorry if I hurt anybody's feelings, but like Alpine's case is they have had tons of turnover, tons of issues, and not necessarily, they're not meshing how they're supposed to mesh. I think it's the perfect way to mention that. And in Fry's case and Fred's case, it wasn't that he was so disrespectful, so wrong, so dictator in a way that he lost people it was almost like hey if they're not meshing if they're not doing well if they're not empowering the team for success hey I'm so sorry to let you go but we're only going to get stronger from here or the weakest links let's empower you to be better and do better so it wasn't like he came in and did full mass destruction he came in and like actually wanted to do and benefit the team yeah i mean like a lot 
like when I've seen new team principals come into teams, pre-existing teams, they often just cut all the heads off that they don't like just because they think that the people that they know from previous teams are better. When Fred, in my opinion, just kind of came in and kind of saw how it was running first before making any decisions. I mean, did he change things? Of course, he had to. But at the same time, he took his time and truly, I feel like, analyzed what the problem was and then, of course, went on a spree to collect them all, starting with Lewis Hamilton. And speaking of Lewis and Charles, I I needed to end the episode this week with a quote that Charles recently said, and that is, Fred is not my girlfriend. Out of context, hilarious. In context, he was responding to a question whether if he's jealous that Lewis Hamilton has an old bond with Fred. I think he's a little jealous. I had to wait till I stopped laughing before. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning all about Frederick as much as we did. Let us know your favorite thing about Fred Vasseur on our socials everywhere we are Paddock Girls Podcast, except Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, where we are Paddock Girls Pod. It is finally race week again, and we're back in Austin. We'll see you next weekend. Thank you for joining us in the paddock. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.